Suna Baba. Protectors of the Suna. Suna Baba. Protectors of the Suna. We're continuing with this new series entitled The Excellence of Remembering Allah. This is a series I've never taught before here on the internet in all the years I've been teaching. Uh, so that's why you can't find these lectures anywhere else other than what I'm uploading now. And that's why there's no PowerPoint you can find on this either because this is the first time I've taught it. And yesterday we spoke about how there are certain words that we can recite on a regular basis. But, and by saying them on a regular basis, it brings about a cure for us in life. It cures us of depression. It cures us of despair. It cures us and prevents us from falling into sin. And those words are as simple as saying Subhana Allah wa bihamdihi or saying Subhana Allah el Adin or saying Subhana Allah alhamdulillah la ilaha illallah Allahu Akbar by saying those simple phrases on a regular basis throughout the day and throughout the night they bring about so many rewards for us. And today what we're going to speak about now is things to not do. There are certain things that we should not do when we are remembering Allah. And this will include answering the question that many Muslims argue and fight and even kill themselves over. And that is the question of using beads or dhikr beads to remember Allah. Is this an innovation? Or is it haram? We're going to answer that question today based on what the prophet told us. Okay. All right. First of all, again, there are some things that we should avoid doing or saying when we remember Allah. For example, a lot of people, how many of you will hear people say, oh, I wished I was dead. Oh, I wished I would just die already. Well, this is something we should never do. Asking for death due to a hardship that you're experiencing, this is something haram for us to do. We have to remember as Muslims, life is meant to be a trial for us. But no matter how difficult it gets, we should never ask Allah to end it for us. Because as long as you are living, then there is hope. So again, you hear the Kafirs always saying, oh, I wish my life were over. I wished I could die. I wish I was dead, you know. Oh, I don't want to live anymore. You know, this is not the correct behavior for a person that believes in Allah. So never ask Allah to end your life. But instead, our prophet taught us that if you are faced with something in life that is so severe, that you don't think you can make it through. You don't ask Allah to end your life. Instead, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, none of you should make a request for death because of the troubles that you are involved in. But if there is no other help or you feel there is no other alternative or you feel that there is no way out, then simply say instead, oh Allah, keep me living as long as life is good for me and bring death to me only when there is no good it is the one only when there is goodness and death for me so here you're not asking to die you're asking Allah to do what's best for you to keep you living as long as life is better for you but if death is better for you then only then are you asking Allah to end it subhanallah Allah see that so I don't want to ever, ever, ever see any of you from my website who are my regular students posting up on Facebook how you wish you were dead because your husband divorced you. I see that a lot on Facebook. Or how you wish you were dead because you lost your job. Or you wish you were dead because you've been diagnosed with a sickness. Because again, even in sickness, even when faced with a severe sickness, 
we should never wish for death. We have the Hadith, whereas Anas said that when Anas was alive, he said, had Allah's messenger not said that none of us could ask for death, I would have definitely done that. Now, this was a companion who was going through a hardship. He was going through a severe illness, and it was so painful. He said the only thing that kept him from, from, wish, from wishing for death as a means of ending the pain was the fact that he remembered how the prophet said we should never ask for death. And then we have another hadith where another companion said he went to visit a companion who had seven cauteries in his stomach. And that person said to him, if a lost prophet have, had, did not forbid for us to ask for death, I would have done so. That's how much pain this companion was suffering from. Okay. So even when we're faced with, with sickness, we should never wish for death. Again, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no one amongst you should make a request for death and do not call for it before it comes to you. Because when any of you dies, so do your good deeds cease. And the life of the believer is not prolonged except for goodness. Again, you know, to, be, uh, to live a long life, this is a blessing. For a law to a law allow you to live a long life, that's a sign that a law is pleased with you. And a law is not going to let you live a long life if it did not bring about good. Does everybody understand that? I had a student about eight years ago. I'm not going to mention the name, but one of you came to this website and you asked me a question. You said, Sister Layla, I don't want to get old. So is there anything wrong with me wishing to die before I get old? Because I just don't want to get old. And I told her, don't you know that getting old is a blessing from a law? You never wish for death. If a law allows you to live to be 80 or 90 years old, this is a blessing. And as the prophet said, a law would never allow a believer to live a long life unless it was to bring goodness for him. Supana Allah. So don't ever curse getting old. Getting old is a sign of Allah's mercy. Because he could have took your life when you were young. Because when he take your life when you long, young, you don't have much time to do good deeds. But you done had 80, 90 years, 60, 70 years, 50, 40 years to do good deeds. This is a blessing. So again, guys, never, ever, ever, ever Call upon a law, asking a law to end your life. And on the other hand, not only does Islam forbid us from asking for a law to end our life, but you should never, ever, ever, ever ask a law to punish you because of the bad deeds you've done or the bad choices you've made. I heard a Muslim do that yesterday. A Muslim I know made the comment, oh, stock for law. Oh, Allah, I wish you'd punish me. Punish me for backbiting. You know, punish me now, Allah. Give me the punishment now for that. A stock for law. This is something that you should never do. We have the hadith where as the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, went to visit a person who was sick, okay? And when he went there, he asked about the person's health. And the prophet, and the person told the prophet, Oh Allah, it's just my health is bad. It's not getting any better. It seems like nothing the doctor is giving me is working. The medicine's not working. I'm just not getting better. I'm getting weaker. So the prophet looked at the, the sick companion and he said, Did you make dua asking Allah for something that maybe you shouldn't have? The man said, well, I did make dua before I became sick. I used to make dua all the time asking Allah to punish me now in this world for the sins I commit rather than punish me in the hereafter. Y'all hear that? How many of you know Muslims who say that? This man who was lying on his deathbed no matter what the doctors did, he was not getting better. 
So the prophet asked him, did you ask Allah for something that maybe you shouldn't have asked for? The man said, well, before I got sick, I used to always make dua asking Allah to punish me now in this world for my sins instead of punishing me in the hereafter. When the prophet heard that, he told the man, Supana Allah, you don't have the power nor the patience to handle the punishment that Allah would give to you in this world for your sins. So never ask Allah to punish you for your sins in this life. Instead say, oh Allah, give me the good of this world and give me the good of the hereafter and save me from the punishment of the hellfire. The prophet said, this is what you should say. You never, ever, ever ask Allah to punish you now for your sins because you wouldn't be able to handle it. And that's why this man was not becoming healthy. That's why he was deteriorating. That's why the man was dying and no one, and he, no medicine worked because he had asked Allah to punish him now and he couldn't take it. So the prophet is telling us never do that. Instead, we should say, oh, Allah, give us the good of this world. Give us the good of the hereafter and save me from the hellfire. And as soon as the prophet made that dua for that companion, guess what happened? That man's sickness immediately went away and he became healed. And this hadith is authentic. It's from Sahih Muslim. Okay. So again, I don't want to hear of any of you asking Allah to punish you now for your sins. Stop doing that. That's why you're, you're, the, the medicines that doctors are giving you are not working. I knew a Muslim sister. She used to always say, oh Allah, punish me now. Punish me now. Punish me in this world now so I can meet you with a clean slate. Well, guess what? She never could keep a husband. Every time she got married, she ended up divorced. Every time she got pregnant, she had miscarriages. She never, uh, or, or, or a couple of times, she gave birth to a child, but the child died. The child was born, stillborn. Okay? And then one day, she went to the doctor. She was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer. I remember when I went to visit her, I told her, I said, sister, so-and-so, you have to stop this. Your life is miserable because all you do is ask Allah to punish you. And I re recited this hadith to her. I said, the prophet said, you, there is no way that any of us would be able to handle the punishment that Allah would give us. Never ask him to punish you in this world. I said, instead, make dua asking for Allah to give you the good of this world and the good of the hereafter protect you from the hellfire. She said, Sister Layla, I never understood the meaning of that hadith before. She knew of this hadith because we used to tell her. I used to tell her, stop doing that. She was a personal no friend of mine. I used to tell her, stop making dua asking Allah to punish you. But and now that she was facing death with cancer, now all of a sudden she understood. Well, guess what? Needless to say, Alhamdulillah, she went for her chemotherapy and her treatment. Her breast cancer went into a uh, recession or whatever they call it. It, you know, went away. And Alhamdulillah, she got married years later. She had kids and I still, she's still my friend today. She's doing so much better. Her life got better because she stopped asking Allah to punish her. So again, guys, stop doing this. And she's not the only one. I'm hearing that there's a lot of Muslims who do this. Punish me in this world of law so I can meet you with a clean slate on a day of judgment. Stop doing that. Never ask to be punished in this world for your mistakes. Instead, ask for forgiveness. Ask Allah to forgive you for your bad choices. Ask Allah to forgive you for your bad deeds. Ask Allah to save you from the hellfire. And ask Allah to bless you with the best of this world and the hereafter. Subhanallah. Stop cursing yourself. 
This is called cursing yourself. And so many Muslims, we go around cursing ourselves out of ignorance and out of fanaticism. Stop doing that. Okay? And maybe your life will change. Maybe your life will change for the better like hers did. Also, another thing that we should avoid in regards to remembering a law. You should not spend the whole day or the whole night doing this. Remember, guys, everything within moderation. Allah does not like a fanatic. Allah does not like an extremist. Allah loves for us to do good deeds according to our capabilities. We have the hadith where as Juwairiyah. Who was Juwairiyah? She was one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One day the Prophet left her at Fajr. And when he left her at Fajr, she was, um, you know, sitting there remembering Allah. And when he came back in the afternoon, she was sitting in the same spot that he had left her in at Fajr. And he said to her, you've been sitting in that same spot since I left? She said, yes. He said, what have you been doing? She said, I've been remembering Allah. I've been talking to Allah. I've been, I, I've been making dua and calling and talking to Allah ever since uh, Fajr. The prophet said, astaghfirullah. He said, I recited four words three times after I left you. And if those four words that I recited were to be weighed against everything that you've been saying to Allah since I left you this morning, guess what? My four words would outweigh yours. He said, and those four words were simply saying, Subhana Allah wa bi hamdihi, adada, kalkihi, wa rida nafsihi, wa zinata, arshihi, wa midada, kalimathihi, which means in English, hallowed be Allah, and praise is due to him to the extent of the number of his creation, and to the extent of his pleasure, and to the extent of the weight of his throne, and to the extent of ink used in recording words for his praise. The prophet said those, that, those four words, or that sentence right there, the simple fact that I said them three times, I got more reward than you sitting here all day saying whatever you were saying. SubhanAllah. Again, guys, Allah doesn't like fanaticism. Allah doesn't like for us to overburden ourselves. And this is what so many deviant Muslim groups do. It's many of the Sufi groups, those Sufi Muslims out there, they spend too much time, all their time praying and all their time reading Quran and not enough time, you know, doing other deeds, you know. There's more good deeds besides reading and praying. SubhanAllah, taking care of your family, that's a good deed. Helping your neighbor, that's a good deed. Going to work to earn money for your family, that's a good deed. Sewing, cleaning, those are all good deeds. Okay? So again, do not spend all your time remembering Allah. You're not an angel. Remember the hadith? Whereas Abu Bakr and another companion... They thought they were going to hell because they would only remember Allah uh, when the prophet was around. Then when the prophet left, they'd go to their families and they'd forget, they, they would spend their time with their families instead of remembering Allah. And they felt they were going to hell. And the prophet had to tell them, you're not an angel. The angels were created to remember Allah 24-7. You are a human being. There's other things you have to do. You have to spend time with your family. You have to go to work. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to cry. There's a time to play. There's a time to be serious. There's a time to worship. And there's a time to sleep. There's a time for this and a time for that. You can't spend all day and night remembering Allah because guess what's going to happen? You're going to get tired of it. You're going to get burned out. And you're going to hate it. You're gonna, And then when you hate it, you're going to stop doing it. Subhanallah. So again, do not spend the entire day or uh, uh, or the entire night remembering Allah. Everything within moderation. And again, guys, don't make the religion hard on yourselves. 
don't make the religion hard on yourselves. And when you spend too much time on something, you're making it that thing hard on yourselves. For example, there's another hadith. And I want you guys to pay attention to this hadith. Once the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, saw a woman who had some date stones or some rocks that she was using as beads to remember Allah with. She was sitting there trying to remember Allah, but she was losing count with her rocks. She couldn't remember how many rocks. The prophet watched her for a minute. And then he went to her. He said, let me tell you something that'll be easier for you to do than what you're doing here. He said, instead of trying to remember how many times to glorify Allah, you know, instead, just simply say, Subhana Allah. In fact, let me read this all in English. He said, simply say, glory be to Allah as many times as the number of what he created in heaven. And then say, glory be to Allah as many times as the number of which he has created on earth. And then say, glory be to Allah as many times as the number of that which he created between them. And then say, glory be to Allah as many times as the number of that which he is creating. Allah is the most great. Say that a similar number of times. And then say, praise be to Allah a similar number of times. And then say, there is no God but Allah. And with that, it's easier. And here the prophet was saying, because this woman was sitting there with these rocks trying to remember, did I do 20 or 30? Uh, I, she was losing her count because she couldn't count. She, even with the rocks, she was having a hard time counting. So rather than waste your time forgetting, just say, glory be to Allah. As many times which you created the heaven, Allah, glory be to Allah. As many times as you created the earth, Glory be to Allah as many times as you created between them. And guess what? It ain't about the numbers. You're getting the reward. Subhanallah. Allah. Again, don't make the religion hard on yourselves. So many of us complicate things. I want to make sure that I say it a hundred times. I want to make sure that I say it a thousand times. I want to make sure I say it 30 times. It doesn't matter. The simple fact that you are saying these words, that's what Allah cares about. The number of times don't matter. Don't complicate the religion, guys. And that brings us to the question that I wanted to answer today. Can we use dicker beads to count with? Is it innovation? Or is it haram? Well, I think you guys know the answer from the hadith I just narrated to you. The previous hadith that we just discussed is the proof that there were some companions who used beads to keep count, to count with during the prophet's time. You guys have to remember that the Arabs were an illiterate nation. Many of them could not read. Many of them could not write and they couldn't count. So some of them would use rocks or beads to help them to try to keep the number correct. In that previous hadith, did the prophet tell the woman that using the beads was haram? No, he didn't tell her, Astaghfirullah, you're innovating. You're going to hell for using rocks or beads. No, he told her, no, let me make it easier for you. Just say, Subhana Allah, say, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, you know, and make it easier. So if it were haram to use the beads, or if it were haram to use the rocks, the prophet would have said so. So anyone who tells you that it's haram, anyone that tells you it's an innovation is a liar. To innovate means to introduce something into our way of worship that was not introduced by the prophet. The prophet did not admonish that woman for using the rocks to count with or the beads to count with. That is not innovation. She's using them to count and she did not know how to count. That's why. 
Okay, so anyone that tells you that if you're using beads, you're innovating, they don't understand their dean. But instead, guys, if you are a person who does know how to count, then you should try to use your fingers. Why? Because what's the purpose of you using the beads? See this picture here? This man is using thicker beads. What does he need to use them for if he knows how to count? Now, if he was a person like that woman in the previous Hadith who didn't know how to count and there were 30 beads there and she knew that they were 30 and she were using them to move her hands around with, then that's fine. But if you know how to count, use your fingers. And what am I basing that on? Well, listen to this. We have an authentic Hadith whereas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded the women who migrated from Mecca to be regular in remembering Allah. These are the women when they migrated from Mecca to Medina, they gave their oath of allegiance to the Prophet. And after giving him their oath of allegiance, he told them, I want you to be regular and consistent in remembering Allah. And the way to do that, he told them, is by saying, Allah is the most great and glory be to him. And there is no God other than he, which is in Arabic is uh, uh, Supana Allah, Alhamdulillah, Allah, 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 and Allahu Akbar. He told them be regular and consistent in saying those words. And he told them to count using their fingers because the fingers will be questioned and will speak on behalf of you on the day of judgment. There you go. So we use the fingers, not because using the beads is an innovation, but we use our fingers because your fingers will be a witness for you. They will testify on your behalf. They will say, oh, Allah, she used to spend her time uh, glorifying you and praising you. And she would count the number of times on her fingers because she wanted the reward of, of doing it a hundred times during the day. So this is why we use our fingers. Those of us who do know how to count. Okay. And also there's another hadith. Whereas the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to use his fingers. He used to use the fingers of his right hand. And again, you want to try to be like him. He was our example. He was our role model. Okay. If the Prophet counted using the fingers of his right hand, then we should try to do the same. But again, if you are a person who does not know how to count, then there's nothing wrong with you using beads. There's nothing wrong with you using rocks or stones. But if you do know how to count, be like the prophet and use your fingers. So your fingers will be a witness for you and your glorification of Allah on the day of judgment. So that answers the question. See how Islam is based on two sources. The book of Allah and the example of our prophet. You don't have to go looking up fatwas on the internet. Fatwas are opinions. Man's opinion. Islam is based on what Allah and the Prophet Wasallam said. And our Prophet com completed his mission. He told us everything that we need to know about worshiping Allah. He even answered the question about can we use beads. And as you can see, there's nothing wrong with using beads. It's not innovation. It's not haram, but it would be better to use your fingers if you know how to count. Okay. Also, another thing that we need to remember when it comes to remembering a law is whenever two or more Muslims come together, we should remember a law in some way. And again, that means even if, say, for example, I'm at the grocery store shopping and I see another Muslim and she comes up to me and we give each other salams. We are now together in a group. It takes two people to equal a group. And since we are together in a group, we should remember Allah in some way. And this remembrance can be by either enjoining the good 
or forbidding the evil to one another or simply reminding one another of our way of life. Or it could simply be by mentioning the name of Allah and our prophet. Any form of remembrance. For example, when I am at the grocery store and I see another Muslim and she comes to me, As-salamu alaykum, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. We're remembering Allah, we're greeting each other. This is also a way of remembering Allah and Kefalik, how are you? Kefaluki, how are you, my sister? I'm fine, and how are you? Oh, I'm doing fine. I'm here shopping at the store. Oh, mashallah. See, mashallah. That's words of remembrance. Alhamdulillah. These are words of remembrance. Subhanallah. So good to see you. Words of remembrance. So again, whenever two or more Muslims come together, we should remember Allah in some way. Even giving the salams. Giving salams, we're wishing the peace and blessings of Allah upon each other. This is a form of remembrance. We have the hadith, whereas the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if people sit in a gathering in which they do not remember Allah or do not send blessings upon me as the Prophet, then it will be a cause of grief for them on the day of judgment. In other words, Allah is going to ask you about it. Okay? Remember, guys, it is an obligation to remember Allah. It's also an obligation to send blessings upon our prophet. How can two Muslims come together and not do so? Look at the picture here. These are two Muslim men who ran into each other on the street. As-salamu alaykum, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. They are remembering Allah. Oh, how are you? Alhamdulillah, everything's fine. Oh, mashallah. Words of remembrance. Okay? So it doesn't just have to be, uh, well, see still. It's so beautiful to see you. But mashallah, uh, the, jibat, the, the hijab you have on, your hair is sticking out. It doesn't have to be admonition. It doesn't have to be something negative. It could be simply greeting one another. This is remembering Allah. Everybody understand that? And finally, guys, Islam forbids us from sitting in a gathering in which sinful things are happening. It is forbidden or haram in Islam for me to be in a group with other Muslims and they are doing wrong. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said if anyone sits in a gathering where there is a wrongdoing done, you should leave. And if you say before you leave, glory be to you, Allah. And I begin with declaring all praises due to you and I testify there is no God but you and I ask your forgiveness and turn to you in repentance. If you say that before you leave, then you will be forgiven of the sin of what the others were doing there. And I'm using this picture here because even at home with your husband, this is a gathering. This is a group, two Muslims together. You're sitting there talking on your phone, but you see that your wife is backbiting. You see your wife is on her cell phone sending texts to another sister backbiting someone else. You're sitting there. You're in a group. You know that your wife is doing this. You should correct her. You should tell her to stop. You should say, glory be to you, Allah. I begin with declaring all praise is due to you. I testify there is no God but you. I ask your forgiveness and turn to your repentance. Allah will forgive you. For sitting there watching her do that like this man is doing. He's sitting there watching her. And then what you do is correct her. You tell her, uh-uh, stop doing that. You don't backbite your sister in Islam. You don't send text messages backbiting somebody else. And I want you guys to remember the prophet taught us the atonement for backbiting or slander is to ask for forgiveness of the person that you backbit or slander. And then ask Allah to forgive you too. If you do that, then you do not have to tell the person what you said about them. Because I get this a lot. Dear Sister Layla, I was text messaging one of my friends and we were talking about another sister. Do I have to call that sister up on the phone and tell her I talked about her? No. The atonement is to ask Allah to forgive you. For what you've done. And ask Allah to forgive the person you backbit of their sins too. 
If you do that, then you do not have to let the person know that you talked about them. Because nine times out of ten, if they find out, they ain't going to deal with you anymore. Which is making a situation even worse. So again, guys, it is forbidden in Islam for us to sit in with another Muslim and you see that that Muslim is indulging in sinful actions. You have to get up and leave. And you should correct that person. You don't sit there like this man is doing just looking. You better get up and say something too. Okay? So thus, guys, um, we're going to stop right here. And this is con going to conclude um, the lecture part on the virtues and the benefits of remembering a law. Tomorrow, what I am going to do, because I just decided to do that today, I'm going to give you guys, present to you guys some common words of remembrance that you can say in specific situations that our prophet taught us that will help to bring relief to you in your life. For example, what is something I can say you know, uh, if I'm going through a hardship or what is something I can say if I'm depressed? What is something I can say when I look in the mirror and I like what I see? <laughs> I'm happy with how Allah made me. Is there a supplication I can say, you know, to show my gratitude to Allah for that? Okay, what is something I can say before I eat, before I sleep, you know, when after taking a shower? I mean, we're going to go over common supplications that our prophet taught us to say in specific situations. OK, so we'll stop right here for today. Uh, if you guys have any. Protectors of the Sunnah. Protectors of the Sunnah.